Hey guys, thank you for joining me today. In this video, we are going to talk about mechanical properties of materials. This topic is very important. We have to understand the behavior of the material so we can use it, we can design it. So to figure out the mechanical properties of the material, we have to conduct the basic tests, which are compression and tension tests. So the strength of a material depends on its ability to sustain a load without undo deformation or failure. So sometimes we have a piece of material can be tested under tension, tension force, so the failure will be fracture. This is the mode of failure if you have a brittle material. Or you can test this piece of material under compression. In this case, we should expect buckling or the compression will cause material to bulk out. Does that make sense? So one of the most important tests to be performed on this strength is the tension or compression test. Uh, so it's a very important to figure out the mechanical properties of a material. The basic tests are compression and tension tests. I will talk about the most common uh, test, which, which is tension test for steel material. We have many other tests, but I'm going to talk about the basic test for steel material, which is tension test. We will have a, a tension tests are used to determine how materials will behave under tension load. In a simple tensile test, a sample is typically pulled to its breaking. So it's a very easy. We have a steel sample. This steel sample should have specific a length, specific size, to be tested according to the standard, but this is outside the scope of this course. We have a steel sample, most of the time steel rod. This sample will be fixed or will be set up in this machine, which is called tension test machine. We have two heads, the upper head and the lower head of the machine. So I'm gonna put my sample in between. Based on the setup of the machine, one of these two heads will move away from the other one. So the, the specimen will be under tension. So your specimen will be in a vertical position like this. One of the heads will be uh, fixed. Like in this case, it's the upper one and the lower one will move down. So this one, no movement. The lower head will move down. So the specimen will be under tension, pulling. Does that make sense? During the test, the amount of the applied force F and the corresponding elongation delta L of the sample are measured through the test. Does that make sense? So to conduct your tension test, we need to prepare your sample. We need to put the sample in the machine between the two heads and then run the test. Then your sample will be under tension during the test. The machine can uh, record the amount of the force applied to the sample and the corresponding elongation of the sample during the test. Let's watch this video. This video will show up how the tension test can be conducted.
Make it bigger. So we have the sample, the steel rod or the steel bar uh, in a specific size, and this bar will be um, hold it, will be set up in the machine between the two heads of the machine. So right now your sample between the two heads of the machine, one of the head will be fixed and the other one is moving away from the first one. That means your sample will be under tension. The, during the test, the machine will record how much force and how much corresponding elongation. So we have records. The force and the elongation. The force and the elongation during the test until failure. As you see, the machine can record the uh, applied force and the elongation. And you can you see from the video, we have elongation. The specimen is stretched under the effect of tension force. Then we have failure. We have failure. This is the end of the test. That makes sense? So, tension test is a very common test. It's used to figure out the mechanical properties of the steel rebar. Uh, one more time, during the test, the machine, the amount of the force F applied to the sample and the elongation delta L of the sample are measured throughout the test. So we have a record of data, force and elongation. I'm gonna use this force, F or P, whatever the symbol, uh, F or P, this force divided by the original cross-section area of the bar will give you the stress, nominal or engineering stress. Remember, your sample has a diameter. This diameter can tell you what is the cross-section area, area node. So area node is the cross-section area of the sample. So I'm going to use the recorded Applied force divided by the uh, uh, cross-section area to give you what is the stress. Also, the recorded elongation, delta L, will be divided by L naught. L naught represented the original lens. Original lens of the sample. If you divided this elongation by the original lens, you can get the engineering strain or nominal strain, the normal strain. So right now, I converted the recorded data, the applied force and the corresponding elongation to the stress sigma and the strain epsilon. Then I will draw a relationship between the applied stress and the corresponding strain during the test, the uh, expected curve or relationship is called stress string curve or stress string diagram for this material. Does that make sense? We have different shapes of this relationship, but this one linear relationship and then uh, plateau and then another curve and then going down until failure. This is the typical shape 
of the stress strain care for steel. So this story is very important to understand it. I'm gonna repeat it one more time here. So guys, we have a sample steel rod or steel repair and this sample has original lens L note and original cross section area A note. This sample will be hold between the heads of tension test machine. So the machine will apply a force F or P, whatever, uh, to apply tension force. During the test, the machine will tell you what is the value of the force and what is the corresponding elongation. Because during the test, as you see in the video, uh, the, 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 the sample will be stretched. Uh, so if you apply more force, more stretch, more force, more stretch, more force, more stretch. So I will start with zero, no stretch. If you increase the force, for example, 1.5 kilonewton, we will have stretch. If you increase the force to 2.5 kilonewton, we will have another stretch. If you increase the force to 5 kilonewton, we will have a corresponding stretch and so on. Until you reach to failure. Until reaching to the failure. So this sample will be broken. Then I will convert this recorded data to stress and corresponding strain. If you divided this force by the original cross-section area, area node, I can convert the recorded force data to stresses. Does that make sense? Also, if you divide this recorded stretch by the original lens of the sample in the node, you can convert this recorded data to strain. So originally, we have force delta or force stretch recorded, force stretch. Then by calculations, I converted the force to stress and the stretch or the elongations to strain. Then I will draw a relationship between stress and the strain. The strain on the horizontal axis, the stress on the vertical axis. So we have a value of stress and the value of strain. We have value of stress and the value of strain, value of stress, value of strain, value of stress, value of stress and the strain, stress and the strain, stress and the strain, stress and the strain. Then go ahead and connect between these points. You can get something called stress strain curve or stress strain diagram. Does that make sense? So let's do an example and to see how can we draw this relationship. We have a tension test, and this tension test was performed on a steel specimen having an original diameter. So this is steel specimen has diameter equal 0.503 inch. That means the original cross-section area of this specimen, which is a circle, cross-section equal by divide 4 times this diameter square. So the cross-section area will be by divide 4 times 0 0.503 square will equal point. 1987 inch square. And the gauge length or the original length of this sample, which is L naught, is given 2 inch. During the tension test, the data listed in this table is recorded. The applied force in KIP and the corresponding elongation in inch. 
we need to draw the stress string diagram for this test or this material. One more time. Uh, the applied force at 0, 1.5, 4.6, 8, and the corresponding stretch. So I will convert this force to stress if you divided the applied load by the cross-section area, this value. So each of these values will be divided by 0.1987 inches square to convert it to stress. And your strain, I'm going to convert the elongation records to strain by dividing the elongation by the original length of the sample, which is 2 inch. So I will convert this table from load elongation recorded data to stress strain calculated data. Does that make sense? I'm going to do this using Excel to be more easy and to save time. I put this data on this uh, Excel sheet. So we have the load, the applied load in caps and the corresponding elongation. So I need to put here what will be the value of the stress. To figure out the value of stress, I will push equal, then divide this number divided by divided by uh, the cross section area of this sample which is 0 0.1987 point one nine eight seven then I will go back to the cell double click on this little point so I repeated this calculation to the rest. So I divided 1.5 by the cross-section area. I divided 4.6 by the cross-section area. I divided 8 by the cross-section area, and so on. If you would like here, I will add a new column called strain. I forget to mention this stress will be KSI. Kip per square inch. Why? Because the applied load in kips and the area of the cross section in inch square, so it will be kips per inch square, which is called case. This strain will be dimensionless. Equal, I will divide the recorded elongation divided by the original length, which was two inch, divided by two. Then I will go back to this cell, double click at this point. So I repeated the calculation to the rest. This strain is dimensionless because you are dividing elongation in inch by original length in inch. So inch by inch will be dimensionless. So I converted the recorded force to stresses. I converted the elongations, the recorded elongations to strain. Then I will start to draw the relationship between stress and the strain. Insert from insert. I can select this. Uh, uh, scatter uh, X and Y relationship, this one. Then right click on this uh, chart and select data, add new data. The X values will be the strain. So I will select these, this data, enter. The Y values, I'm gonna select the, these values. Then enter, and then OK, OK, here you go. This is the stress strain curve. The horizontal axis represented the strain, the vertical axis represented the stress. If you would like to adjust uh, this diagram, it's Excel, you can come here from design, a chart, you can add axis, primary, horizontal. I can say it's called strain, enter. And then go back here and this select axis, axis titles, vertical axis. It will be called the stress and I can say KSI, enter. Does that make sense? 
you can adjust this horizontal axis uh, by selecting this option line uh, solid uh, make the color to be black and make it thicker like this and so on does that make sense so one more time it's very important to understand how to convert the recorded data to stress train diagram during the test we are going to record how much load how much corresponding elongation then I will divide each value of the recorded uh, force or the recorded load by the original cross-section area of the sample. Then I convert this column to something else called stress. Then the corresponding elongation, each value in this column will be divided by the original length of the sample to figure out the strain. Then I figured out this column strain. Once you uh, figured out the two columns, stress and strain, I'm going to draw a relationship between stress and, and strain. Strain in the horizontal axis, stress on the vertical axis. You can find out this common or this typical shape of the stress-strain diagram for steel. That makes sense? I would like to define different um, behavior or different concepts or what are the different parts of this stress strain diagram. Keep in your mind, at the beginning, we have a linear relationship between stress and the strain. This linear relationship, which is this one, started from zero, ended at this point which is called proportional limit so this is not 100% uh, all the time but this is the typical behavior of steel under tension uh, the relationship between strain and stress started with linear relationship started from zero ended to a point which is called sigma pl which is called proportional limit and during this stage of loading, we are in an elastic behavior. What you mean by elastic behavior? The material is uh, the, the material behaves like rubber pan. If you apply a force, the material will be stretched. If you remove the force, the material will return back to the original sheep. So elastic behavior is the ability of a body to resist any permanent change when stress is applied. When stress application ceases, the body regain its original shape and the size. No change, no permanent deformation. If you remove the applied force, the material will return back to the original shape, the original size. The upper stress limit to this linear relationship is called proportional limit. Does that make sense? If you look to the, this example, we have this linear relationship starting from zero, ended at this proportional limit, which is, I think, this point is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, at 11. So the proportional limit looks like something around 55.35. This stress is called proportional limit. This is the end of the linear relationship. That makes sense? The slope of this linear relationship, if you can figure out the slope of this linear relationship, this slope is called modulus of elasticity or youngest models modulus of elasticity or sometimes youngest models Does that make sense we have two terms represented this slope so the stress strain diagram for most engineering materials exhibit a linear relationship between stress and the strain within the elastic re region as we mentioned, the first part of the relationship between stress and the strain is linear. The slope 
of this linear relationship is called modulus of elasticity represented by capital E. Modulus of elasticity, or sometimes we can call it Young's modulus. That makes sense? In this case, or in this region, elastic region, we have a proportional relationship between stress and strain. More stress means more strain. And the relationship between both of them can be written like this, which is called hook the law. Hook the law means the stress equal youngest modulus time strain. Only this relationship only is valid during the elastic region. During the linear relationship between stress and the strain, only, only, only the uh, hook, the law, the relationship between stress and the strain, where stress equal youngest modulus time strain, this relationship is only valid during the elastic region. Does that make sense? So, so far, we... Uh, Clarify, the first uh, relationship between stress and strain is a linear relationship. During this linear relationship, the material is elastic. And the end of this linear relationship at the top here is called proportional limit. And the slope of this linear relationship is called the modulus of elasticity or youngest modulus. In this range or in this region, we have a relationship between stress and strain. So stress equal youngest modulus time straight if you would like to figure out the slope of this linear relationship you can select any point any two point like this point this is stress and the strain you can divide the stress by strain you can get the slope of this linear relationship we will do it in a different example after we reach it to the end of the linear relationship, the curve or the relationship started to be a little curve and then constant. This constant uh, uh, relationship between strain and strain and stress means we have more deformation, however, the applied force is constant or approximately constant. So a slight, in, a slight increase in the stress above the elastic limit will result in a breakdown of the material and cause it to deform permanently. This behavior is called yielding, and it is indicated by the rectangular dark orange. This one is called yielding. We have plateau. We have constant relationship between strain and stress. What do you mean by constant? We have more strain, however, the applied stress is constant. The stress that cause yielding is called yield stress. Sigma yield, sigma y, or fy. That makes sense? So keep in your mind, after we finish the elastic region, we will start yielding. Yielding means we have constant stress we are not increasing the applied force. However, we have more deformation. We have more strain. We have permanent strain. So this plateau will represent a region which is called yielding. The stress, the corresponding stress for this plateau is called yielding stress. If you look to this example, we have here a horizontal relationship. If you look, the stress, I'm sorry, the stress is constant, 59, 59.38, 59.38. However, we have more strain, 0 0.0025, 0 0.004. So we did not increase the force. However, the, we have more deformation. So I can say at this level, the yielding stress will be 59.386. That makes sense? At this level, the corresponding stress will be yielding stress, sigma y or can be called Fy. So the behavior of the material under tension test will start with linear relationship, which is called elastic region. Then we will have constant stress and the more strain, which is called yielding. 
after the end of yielding, we will have another curve starting from here, going up by a curve until hitting the highest level in the curve. This curve or this region is called strain hardening. Strain hardening started by the end of the yielding region until you reach to the highest level of the curve, which is called ultimate stress. So when yielding has ended, an increase in the load can be supported by the specimen, result, resulting in a curve that rises continuously, but becomes a flutter until it reaches a maximum stress, which is called ultimate stress. This is the highest stress we can reach. That makes sense. The rise in the curve, this part of the curve, is called strain hardening. Does that make sense? This region is called strain hardening. Started from the end of the yielding until the ultimate stress. What you mean by ultimate stress? Ultimate stress is the highest level of stress that can be supported by the material, which is called sigma U. Sigma ultimate, or sometimes F alt. Then the curve will start to go down until reaching to the uh, fracture. So fracture stress is the level of stress at the failure. Exactly when the material or when the specimen fail or when the specimen is broken, at this point, your stress is called fracture stress. If uh, Sigma F or FF. Does that make sense? Uh, we have, until reaching to the highest level of stress, ultimate stress, until failure, this descending relationship between stress and strain, we will have nicking. What you mean by nicking? This point is very important. Keep in your mind, uh, the first relationship is linear, elastic. Then we have uh, yielding. Then we will have strain hardening. The curve is going up. During this strain hardening, during this strain hardening, the cross section area of the specimen will decrease. If you look here, the original cross section was something like this. Then the cross section area became smaller and then smaller. Until you reach to the highest level of the stress, which is called ultimate stress, at this point, we will have local decrease in the cross section, which is called nicking. Until we will have failure at this localized region. So, up to the ultimate stress, the specimen elongates and its cross-section area will decrease. This reduction in the cross-section area occur during the entire length of the specimen. So if you look here, the entire length of the specimen, the cross-section area decreased through the entire length. Until you reach to ultimate stress, until we reach it to the ultimate stress here, we will have cross-section area will begin to decrease in a localized region. Only one part, local part of the specimen, we will have more reduction in the cross-section area. As a result, constriction or neck tends to form in this region as the specimen elongates further. This region of the curve due to necking is indicated in the dark this one. Does that make sense? So, uh, we defined the different parts of the uh, stress string curve. Keep in your mind the first part, which is linear relationship, we have elastic uh, region. After this elastic region to the failure of the specimen, we will have plastic behavior. Plastic behavior means if you remove the applied force, the material will not recover, will not return back to the original shape. 
in the plastic behavior, we have three different regions. The first one is yielding. The second one is called strain hardening. The third one is called nicking. Keep in your mind, keep in your mind, we have three different definitions can be uh, defined uh, or three different uh, parameters can be defined from the stress strain curve. The first one is called modulus of elasticity, E, which represents the slope of the linear relationship during the elastic region. And in this linear relationship, we have a relationship between stress and strain. Stress equal E times strain, which is called hook velocity. The second concept, which is called modulus of resilience. Modulus of resilience, physically, a material, the resilience res represents the ability of the material to absorb energy without any permanent damage to the material. To make sure your material will support any impact load, uh, the material can absorb any energy without any permanent deformation. We will have elastic deformation, but no permanent deformation. The material can be recovered. The modulus of resilience for any material equal the area under the re linear relationship of the stress strain curve. So the area under this linear relationship will represent the modulus of resilience. Does that make sense? If you can figure out the total area under the whole stress strain curve, this area represents something called modulus of toughness. The modulus of toughness indicates the strain energy density of the, of the material just before it fractures. This property becomes important when designing a member that may be accidentally overloaded. It represents the entire area under the stress strain curve. So if you figured out the, linear, uh, the stress strain curve, if you draw the stress strain curve like this example, so the area, I'm sorry, first, the slope of the linear relationship, the slope of the linear relationship represents the modulus of elasticity. If you can figure out the area under the linear relationship, this triangle, this little triangle, this little triangle represents the modulus of resilience. If you can figure out the area under the whole curve, what is the whole area under the curve? It represents the modulus of toughness. Does that make sense? I will do an example in the next video to figure out the stress strain curve and to figure out the different values on this curve, including modulus of elasticity, modulus of resilience, and the modulus of toughness.